pray that you bless uh, the evening sermon here. I pray you give me the words to say, and I pray that uh, everyone would would be a, appreciative and attentive, uh, especially to the subject tonight, the blood of Jesus. I thank you for that blood. Without that blood, we'd all be on our way to hell. Without that blood, we'd have no forgiveness, no redemption. We wouldn't be purchased. We'd still be in our sins. And Lord, I thank you for shedding it, dying for us, going to the cross, taking our sin debt and our burden, bearing it for us, uh, being buried, and especially rising from the dead. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that you bless tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the kids can go ahead and be dismissed. All right, so the title of the message tonight is Washed in the Blood. Is that a scriptural thing to say? When you say to somebody, I'm washed in the blood, people would say, what do you mean you're washed in the blood? You know, it used to be that people understood what that meant. Now anymore, people don't have any idea what that means, to be washed in the blood. Tonight, either you're clean or you're unclean. You know, when somebody in the Bible got leprosy, they went around crying, unclean, unclean. And everyone around them knew, don't, don't touch that person. Don't go near them. They were warning everybody, stay away from me. I have leprosy. I'm unclean. Leprosy was very, very contagious. Uh, they cried unclean. And you know, Christ had power to heal leprosy. Didn't he heal the 10 lepers? And they went away and one of them on the way out. And this, this is sad, really, when you think about it. People get saved and then they never do anything for the Lord. Um, there's a certain appreciation for what God's done for us that we as Christians need to understand that, yeah, we're saved, but it doesn't give us a license just to go live the way we lived before. We should be appreciative. Like the one leper, as they were walking away, he turned around and he gave glory to God, didn't he? And then Jesus said to him, he said, weren't there 10 lepers? He said, where are the nine? Where are the nine? And tonight, and I'm sure other preachers across the country say, where are the nine? Where are the nine? Christians aren't faithful to church anymore. And it's a shame. And you, we can point all the fingers we want and say our country's a mess because of the politicians. Our country's a mess because of this. Our country's a mess because of uh, loose living. Our country's a mess because of immoral dress. Our country's a mess because... But when it boils down to it, our country's a mess mor morally because Christians have quit living for God. If Christians would live for God, this country would turn around. How many Christians tonight aren't doing anything for the Lord? And as the scripture says, judgment must first begin where? At the house of God. It begins with us. We turn things around. And then through our prayers and through our witnessing, we begin to turn things around. We have a Bible, don't we? The Word of God. Here it is. It gives everything we need for living, everything we need for dying, everything we need for coping. How many people have no hope? They can't cope. And here we have a Bible. And how many people in the world tonight don't have one? And many of us have more than one. We have bunches but yet we don't give it the attention it deserves. It tells us such wonderful stories, and it begins in Genesis and all the way through Revelation. The trail of blood you can find throughout the Bible, and you can find the type of Jesus and his death woven right in the book of Genesis. You can see it right in the beginning. And I just happened to look at that lamb right there in that picture. You see that, and in the beginning, there was a shepherd. In the beginning, there was someone who took care of his flock, and he was killed. He was killed, and his blood flowed out of him, and his blood cried. You know, there's something about the red stuff that flows out of a, out of a living thing, the blood. Blood's in that animal, the lamb. Wasn't Jesus, wasn't he, behold, what did John the Baptist say? Behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. I was thinking about that tonight too. Behold the Lamb of God. 
he was a sacrifice. That what? Here's the beauty. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He just doesn't cover them. He takes them away. Every sin we've ever committed, the Lord has the power to take it away from us. Think about what sin can do to people. Think about the guilt, and the shame, and the pressure mentally, the struggles that people have with their sin. Think about all that people have done. And I tell people all the time, you don't have to live with that guilt. You can give it to Christ. And the beauty of him is he takes it away. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The, the power of the blood of Christ is able to take it away. Take it away. But we notice that blood is living. Blood is living. Tonight, you're alive because you have something flowing in you. And when that stops flowing, guess what happens to you? You die. Believe me, I've been in the medical field for a long time, and I've seen a lot of blood. And I know when a person loses too much blood, the life of that person goes. And when somebody loses too much, they say we couldn't save them. They bled out. They bled out. They lost their life. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. So if blood is the life, that means blood has a voice. And blood can talk. Am I crazy? Does the Bible back that up? Sure does. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Without further delay, let's get in our Bible. Amen. Praise God you have a Bible. Praise God. You got it right in your lap and you can turn with me. And if that weren't enough and you don't like turning pages, you could actually get your phone out and get your Bible app and you could look at that. Now, for those of you who use your Bible and you're looking at your Bible app, I hope you're not reading messages and sending text messages instead of looking at your Bible app. But you'd never do that, would you? Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. I find it comical. Uh, I still, there's something about just having a book, isn't there? There's something about it. It's just the turn in the pages. And as a preacher, I like to hear that. I like to hear that. You know, when you're always saying, oh, yeah, that, that sound is so refreshing, hearing people turn their Bible pages. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, this is the first murder in the Bible, and it happened between brothers. It happened because someone envied uh, their brother, Cain, envied Abel, because Abel's offering was accepted by God. But you'll notice the key element in Abel's offering was blood. Vegetables don't bleed. Cain brought vegetables before the Lord. And it says in verse number, uh, number three, it says, and in the process of time, chapter four, verse three, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. So there were two offerings. One had produce on it. There was probably a nice big head of cabbage there. The carrots, peppers, some squash, maybe zucchini. There was tomatoes. There was all kinds of produce here, some corn, some wheat. And he laid that out before the Lord. And over here, Abel took his offering. He took one from his flock, from his herd, and he killed this offering. And what flowed out of it? Blood flowed out of it. And they offered them both up before the Lord. And when the offering came up before the Lord, the Lord smelled this one. Oh, no, 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 not, not that. And the Lord smelled this one. Oh, that's it. That's the one I accept. Why did he accept this one? He accepted that one because this one had blood. This one was what God wanted. And in, it was a type of what was going to happen later on. And God knew that, of course, in God's foreknowledge, this was a perfect type of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Now, 
Then we take the two people, Cain, they didn't accept my offering. You know, God doesn't want our good works, does he? When it comes to salvation, he's not interested in what we have to offer him. He really isn't. What he wants to do is for us just to come to him. We come to him and say, Lord, here I am. I'm just a dirty, filthy sinner. That's all I am. I have nothing to give you. I fall at your mercy. Lord, I want salvation. A contrite heart, right? Lord, a contrite heart, O oh Lord, thou wilt not despise. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a contrite heart and saveth such, or nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. So when you come before the Lord, you're broken. I want to be saved. I offer you nothing. That's exactly the attitude God wants. When we have something to offer God, God says, I'm not interested in what you have to offer. I did it all. Did it all. The lamb type of Christ. Abel turns into a type of Christ. He talks with his brother after this. Cain is still wroth. He's upset, not so much with his brother. He's upset with God, isn't he? He's upset because God rejected his offering. So he finds his brother, and what's he do? He kills him. He kills him. It looks here in verse number seven, six, and the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? Why is thou, thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? See, he couldn't hide it. He killed him in the field. He might have even tried to throw the dirt over top of him. He might have tried to conceal all that. But what was the problem? The problem was is that something came out of Abel's body. I don't know if this was a head wound, if he, if he impaled him with something, but we know that blood came out. And there lied the bloody dead man, and blood leached out and went down to the ground. And the blood had a voice, and the blood cried, didn't it? The life went out of him, and the life cried to God. You know, today the world stands guilty. The world stands guilty. The blood of Christ was shed for mankind, and man rejects it. Man rejects it. If they don't get saved, they reject it. And how much sore do you think the punishment is going to be from the hand of God for those that reject the bloody sacrifice of the Son of God? The voice of Jesus, the blood, and the blood still lives. Blood still lives. Perfect type of Jesus Christ, Abel was. He died at the hands of his brother. He died. His blood cried out to God. Okay? Blood, it's alive, it gives life. Go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And if someone sheds living blood and murders somebody, the Bible upholds a death penalty. Because when life is taken, life for life, as the scripture says. It says in chapter 9, and the Lord tells him right here. It says in verse 4. But the fle but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God may he, made he man. So right there in verse 6, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Okay, so blood is alive, and blood gives you life. Uh, you know, do you ever see the Red Cross or Central Blood Bank? They say, give the gift of what? They say it. They probably don't even know why they're saying that. Give the gift of life. Isn't that true? When you take a pint of blood, who's ever given a pint of blood? Give a pint of blood? It looks like it's dead, right? 
But what kind of power does it have? Somebody who's dying in need of that blood? You take that pint of blood, a couple pints of blood, give it to somebody that's down three pints maybe, and you give them a couple pints of blood, what happens? They begin to refresh, don't they? You're giving them the gift of life. Now, in all this, let's think about what the power of human blood can do. Think about what the power of God's blood can do. If human blood can give life to a dying person, what can God's blood do? <laughs> okay. Blood, this is crazy here. Blood protects. Blood protects. How does it protect? Didn't we sing a song? We sang nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sang, are you washed in the blood of the lamb? And we sang another one. What was that song? When I see the blood. So blood can protect. When did it do that? That death angel was coming, wasn't he? The Lord said, I'm going to prepare you. I'm going to give you a warning. Just like he warns the world today. He warns the world today. Back then he gave warning. And he said, you better cover yourselves in the blood. You better get the blood on the door. I want it here. I want it here. And I want it here. And I don't want pig's blood. And I don't want dog's blood. And I don't want cat's blood. I don't want the blood of a squirrel. I don't want the blood of a possum. I don't want the blood of anything. I want the blood of the lamb on there. You say, wow. Christ is woven throughout the whole Bible. I can see it. Behold the Lamb of God, right? John the Baptist. Why did they use a lamb's blood back here? God in his foreknowledge knew what was coming, didn't he? He said, get the blood of the lamb on the door. And if you do it, when I come down there and I send that death angel down, and when he comes to that door, he'll look and he'll know. If it's dog's blood, he'll know it's an imposter. It's wrong, but he sees the lamb's blood. He knows when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Does Christ see the blood on your heart tonight? How chilling would it have been if we'd have been there that night? And let's say we were all one big happy family. Relatives get together. They say, pack the house. We got one lamb, and we're going to cover the door. We're going to do it here and here and here, and we'll cover the firstborns. Who's a firstborn in here? Put your hand nice and high. You firstborn. Come on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got eight of you. Now, as a middle child, my sister's back there she's a firstborn i might go out and say oh I have my sister i'm gonna wipe that off <laughs> she'd say kevin did, did did you check it yeah i checked it colleen it there i checked it i checked it i got a rag and i wiped it off no you didn't no i didn't i'm joking you sure and the rest of you wouldn't you be wouldn't you be wondering that blood's still out there? You sure it's there? Then when you started to hear the cries, the screams, oh, a dead one, another dead one, oh, another dead one. Oh, the cries coming throughout Egypt that night. But where were there no cries? Where the blood was, where the blood was, is the blood on you. Oh, I tell you, thank God for the blood. I have you saying amen before the night's up. Even if you say, I wasn't in a good mood. I'm tired. I just want to hear. Well, this ought to perk you up. This ought to perk you up. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When you stand before God and he looks at you and he says, I can't condemn you. I can't send you to hell. You're covered. You're covered. The blood protects. The blood protects. 
All right, I told you that story. That's in Exodus 12. We can read two verses there. Let's go to Exodus 12, just so you get the scripture. Exodus 12, types of Christ and his blood throughout the Old Testament. Exodus 12. Exodus 12, and look in verse 21. I would never wipe the blood off, Colleen. I protect my sister. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verse 22. Now let's look in verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out and take you a lamb. See, a lamb, specific, according to your families, and kill the Passover, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts. Why three spots? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But wouldn't God the Father in his foreknowledge see something in the future? Wouldn't he see the one in the middle being higher than the other two? Wouldn't he see his son? Wouldn't he see the other two on the side? Wouldn't he see the three crosses? Say, yeah, that would do it, Pastor. Couldn't it be Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Couldn't it be that his son would stretch his hands out like this? And if I went like this, what would I have? I would have a head spot, wouldn't I? And I would have two arm spots on the side. And if you drew a line all the way to the floor and across, what would you have right on that door? What would you have? A line from here down and a line from here to here. What would I have? I'd have a cross. I'd have a cross. I'd have a cross. In the middle of that thing, would be the heart of a person, wouldn't it? Be right there, right there. See, you read it, sometimes it escapes us. And say, wow, then all of a sudden the light comes on later. You go, wow, why did I think of that? God already knew that. That's the thing when you read your Bible, God already knows what's in there. And all you got to do is say, Lord, open my understanding. Show me, show me, show me. You can't exhaust what's in here. Men have tried. You can't get to the depths of the riches and, and wisdom of God. It's very hard to do. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 22, and take ye a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel on the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. So we can see from right here, the blood protects. The blood lives, the blood protects, okay? The blood of Christ, the Lamb of God. Let's turn to Ephesians in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now we're going to go to the New. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. These are some tremendous verses for salvation and coming to Christ and what Christ did, did for us when we got saved. We did nothing really to get saved. We didn't offer Christ any good works of ours. We just came as we were, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Not, it says in verse 8, for by grace are ye saved. Amen? By grace, by grace, God's grace, unmerited favor. We didn't deserve it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. How precious is his gift. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I often tell people when I'm witnessing to them, if you could work your way into heaven, then you could stand before God and you could say, God, I didn't need your sacrifice. God, I didn't need you. I got here all by myself. And you'd see their chest begin to puff up. I got here all by myself. God won't let that happen. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. Here's going to be our attitude when we stand before God. Not one of these. I did it. One of these. Oh, thank God for him. 
thank God for him. And Jesus will stand up and he'll say, I did it all for him. I did it all. He's clean. He's clean. Aren't you glad you got an advocate? I don't want to stand before God without having Jesus Christ there and say, everything's good. I did it all. I did it all. Doesn't he tell us that? Okay. Verse 10. Look what it says. For we are his. His workmanship. That means he did it. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember. He would always, always have that remembrance, that memory of what we were before we came to Christ. What were we? Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. Can you remember when you were? Remember the days when you were lost? When you were without Christ? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, right now, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We were far off and now we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You know what that means? That means that here we were, <clears throat> and there was God. And between us was what? A partition, a wall. We could not get to him. And when we got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ, whether he took a sledgehammer or whatever he did, he broke down that wall. Knocked it down. And he said, now, Come to the Father. And you know, tonight, the blood of Christ gives us access. We have access. You ever wonder why God allows us to pray? See, we think prayer, I'll do it when I want to. Prayer is a privilege. Prayer is an honor. Why, without Christ, we can't go in. See, we should look at prayer and say, wow, that's a privilege. I can step, I can step into the presence of Almighty God. And God doesn't say, get away from me. By the blood of Christ, he's given us boldness, the Bible says, and access into the throne room of God. We can walk in. Good morning, God. I know. I know. And God doesn't say, lightning bolt disintegrate them. Fire come up and just ignite. No, he doesn't do that. He says, you're welcome. What do you need to talk about? So let me ask, who takes advantage of prayer? What kind of prayer life do you have? So much entitlement in the world, right? Everybody's entitled to everything. I'm entitled to this. No, if we really got what we deserved, where would we be? I want to say it again. Thank God for the blood of Christ. You don't realize. Sometimes I don't either. I admit it. I don't always realize what it did for me. It made me nigh, gave me access. It brought me in. It purged me. It purged me. It washed me. You can honestly say to anybody, listen, I've been washed in the blood of Christ. Is that scriptural? Okay. If it is, where is it? Oh, preacher, I believe that scripture. I bet my life on it. It's there. Where? Where is it? 
Who thinks it's there? We sing it, don't we? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We all sing and say, Man, I'm washed. Where's it tell you that? There it is. Revelation. Revelation chapter one. You say, I knew that. I'm just being bashful. All right. I'm glad everybody knew that. Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one. It's scriptural to sing that. Washed in the blood. It comes right out of here. Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one and look in verse number five. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, thank God, amen, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So tonight we can all say, amen. We've been washed in the blood of Christ. Washed. We've got redemption. Redemption. Okay? Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. I just have a couple more verses and I'll be close. Colossians chapter 1. I can find really no greater subject in the scripture than the blood of Christ when you think about it. Without the blood, we're nothing. Everything else we read about in the Bible is made made. It's made real and true by the blood of Christ, and it's made doable by the blood of Christ. Colossians chapter 1 in verse 14, and this is a, a verse that the new Bibles love to mess with. You have an NIV, New International Version tonight, and some of the other new ones. Not all the new ones do it, but they do it. They take out the most important part of the verse, and it's right in the middle. Colossians 1, 14 in the King James, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. How important is that? Have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Tonight, if you have an NIV or you know someone that does, the reading in it is, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. They take out through his blood. Somebody didn't want him to know about the blood. The devil hates the blood. The devil would love to get the blood out of there. But thank God the blood's in there. And thank God it's supposed to be in there. It gives us redemption, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And in closing, did you pay God anything to be saved? Is it only for the rich? Did God want your credit card account? Did God say, I'm not going to save you unless you put down on that altar $1,000 tonight? In fact, I'm feeling like I need a little bit more than that. I need 10,000 tonight. Is that how God works? What is salvation? What is it? It's a gift. And it's free. So here's the question. Why doesn't everybody take it? How many people have you witnessed to that said, nah, I got my own way. Nah. I have my own church. Nah, I don't believe that. Did Christ die for all people? If the whole world tonight would get under conviction, could God save the whole world at the same time? Is the blood of Christ capable of washing over 7 billion people's sins away? Is it? That's a lot of people, and that's a lot of sin. Could he save 7 billion at once? Oh, the whole world could just hear this tonight and in unison just get on their face and cry out to God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord would say, you're saved. And he would wash them, wouldn't he? I thought about this morning. I, I actually stopped walking. It, it was on me so heavy this morning just to say thanks to God. I was walking and I, I was praying and I stopped and I said, God, I put my head down. I said, who am I? Who am I? 
who was my father and my sisters and my family members, all that are saved, and almost all of them are, to my knowledge, they all are. Who am I that you would save me? And I thought of the billions and billions and billions tonight that don't know God. And I thought, I could easily have been one of them. And I started walking and I said, but I'm not. But I'm not. I'm saved. I am washed. I am redeemed. I've been bought with a price. The Lord said, I love him so much. I'll purchase him. And I, as well as you, you're saved tonight. You became a son of God. You became a son of God. And you know what that has come, what that has with it? We get all the inheritance that Christ has. Now, later on, about an hour from now, you'll run around your house and you'll say, oh, it hit me. Wow. I get all the riches that Christ has. Every one of them. We are joint heirs with Christ. You know what an heir is? Let's turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, and I'll close with this verse. 1 Peter chapter 1. This message should put the wind in your sails tonight. You walk out of here whistling and say, man, that's great stuff. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll look in verse 18. The Lord doesn't care about silver and gold. What's he say about it? 1 Peter 1, verse 18. I'll wait for everybody to get there. You ready? Here we go. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. And of course, that should never be the, that should never be the focus of a church either, should it? Never. Never. If we ever start focusing on silver and gold and riches and money, we've fallen from what God called us to do, haven't we? What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Preach the word. Let God take care of everything else. Let him take care of everything else. I can get up here and say, I'm going to pass the offering plate. You know, we pass it, but if you give, you give. If you don't, you don't. It's not about how much is given not about how much money is received it's not about silver and gold yeah of course you need those things to keep the lights on and put heat in the place but even if we couldn't have heat wear coats what's the most important thing the word the word for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers how were we redeemed then 19 but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Redemption, redemption. Praise God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, now 